Hi folks, welcome to the third and final installment of my liquefaction lecture series. This is a very brief lecture and we're going to talk about the effects from liquefaction. You'll recall that part one of the <coughs> excuse me, of the liquefaction lecture series focused on susceptibility and introduced the idea of initiation. Lecture two focused solely on initiation and talked about how we used to evaluate liquefaction initiation in the laboratory, uh, but using techniques developed um, in the 1970s, a simplified method, we can now predict liquefaction triggering um, potential or liquefaction initiation potential using in situ methods evaluating the, fo the, the soil in the field. And then I introduced you to the Idris and Boulanger liquefaction triggering model, which you will apply on your homework this week. So in this lecture, we're just going to talk about some of the possible effects <clears throat> that can occur during liquefaction. And this whole lecture is, is completely conceptual, but uh, it's intended to help you build a little bit of judgment so that you can recognize what things you might need to be concerned about if you predict that liquefaction will trigger um, at your side or beneath your structure. The first one is um, the alteration of the ground motion. And so we know that when soil liquefies, uh, essentially what happens, oh goodness, why is my screen changing? Essentially what happens is that uh, the shear modulus goes down drastically. And if the shear modulus goes down drastically, then the natural period of the soil goes up drastically as well. So the soil loses stiffness, it loses strength, and it increases in its natural period. Uh, because of that, that soil layer is going to filter out a whole bunch of the um, low period, high frequency ground motions. They, they won't get through that liquefied layer. The layer acts like a base isolation layer. Instead, um, what's going to come through that liquefied layer are the very high period, low frequency motions. Um, and, and we can see it, right? If, if I look at, say, these time histories right here from uh, an earthquake, we can see that in this portion of the time history in the record, you can see that um, there's a lot of high frequency stuff. And then right about five seconds or so, there's a marked change between the um, wavelength and the frequency of the ground motion. And that's the point where liquefaction triggered. Same thing right here, a lot of high frequency stuff. And then at a period of about five seconds in this earthquake, you can see a marked change in the frequency content. Um, in this earthquake, a lot more high frequency stuff up to about 10 or 11 seconds, and that's when the change occurred for it um, in the up direction. And so, you know, um, this is the same station, by the way, that's east-west, that's north-south, that's up-down. So these are the three um, axes for one station where earthquake motions were recorded. How is this important or potentially impactful to you? Well. If you have a structure that has a very high period, um, the occurrence of liquefaction can amplify high period ground motions. Um, if you have a very low period structure, um, the, the onset of liquefaction can actually filter out ground motions that might be detrimental to your structure. So in terms of just pure <coughs> ground shake, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> ground shaking, the liquefied soil may help you by filtering out motions that, that could cause your structure to resonate. The downside is, though, that the other effects from liquefaction may um, counter um, act the, this beneficial effect. Uh, the second effect I want to talk about is post-liquefaction settlement. And so um, anytime you have liquefied soil, the soil particles get closer together, water gets ejected, and the volume of the soil changes. So the soil has the appearance of compacting or settling. 
Um, and it can settle tr tremendous amounts, like you can see in this picture. I mean, in this picture, we have um, easily over a meter of settlement between um, the structure and the ground outside it. And what happened, at least with this structure, is the structure was founded on piles uh, and the ground all around it settled. And so it gives the appearance that the structures pop out of the ground. Um, so anytime you have lifelines, like you can see this pipe coming in, you, you can imagine that this type of uh, effect can be really devastating and damaging. A third effect is the loss of bearing capacity. So if you have liquefied soils that are shallow and very close to the ground surface and you're relying on the sheer strength of those soils to keep your structures upright, you could have a significant problem. Um, liquefied soil drastically loses its sheer strength and as a result you can have stuff like this happening where buildings are tipping over um, or um, and it can work the other way too like if you have buried tanks you have tanks that can pop out of the ground and start floating like they're on water um, all because of a loss of shear strength and so you know this is an important effect to consider especially if you're dealing with shallow footings embankments anything that you're relying on um, shallow soils to provide shear strength if you, if you have deep foundations like piles or drilled shafts, um, this loss of bearing capacity isn't that big of a deal. You have increased lateral loads on the walls. Now, this one is, is kind of interesting. Uh, this is a picture of a key wall. Uh, so this is the edge of a wall in a port in Kobe, Japan. And you can see how the wall has moved um, out towards the water a little bit. It's rotated out and it's caused this settlement uh, to form behind the wall like this little graben like structure. So what happens is um, when you liquefy soil, the soil cannot sustain the active case and, um, and most of the retaining walls are designed for the active case. And so as a result <coughs> <clears throat> the um, lateral earth pressures increase. And how much do they increase? Well, they can actually, during liquefaction, they can actually approach hydrostatic pressures. And, and so what do I mean by that? Um, if, if I have a retaining wall uh, with water behind it, and that retaining wall is, is you know, um, pushing over to the, uh, wanting to tip over, I have normally, you know, earth pressures that are being applied behind that retaining wall. And, and that may be, um, you know, equal to sigma prime times K alpha normally. But if this soil here liquefies, that's going to cause a dramatic increase in my soil to the point that the lateral, the horizontal force is going to equal the vertical force times K, where K is going to approach a value of 1.0. And so the horizontal stress can, can almost equal the um, saturated unit weight times the depth in, in the ground. Um, and so you can get some enormous lateral earth pressures uh, acting on walls if the material behind the wall liquefies. Uh, flow failures, this is the scary one that we've already talked about a little bit. If, if the liquefied soil can't support its own weight and it's on a slope, usually um, the slope is going to be equal to or greater than a, a six degree gradient. If, if that's the case, then uh, and the soil liquefies, you can see some dramatic and very large soil deformations. And uh, you know, this type of deformation is widely considered to be the most dangerous of all the effects of liquefaction because anything that's located down slope of the failing ground um, can get buried or if in the case of like this, you know, lower San Fernando Dam, you can see there's a city right down here below the dam where the water could have easily have flooded it. 
Um, number six, lateral spread displacement. So this is a picture from a port in um, Haiti in 2010 after its earthquake. You can see how the ground has moved towards the open face there near the port and uh, <coughs> has caused some damage to the infrastructure there in the port. Lateral spread is a function of cyclic mobility. And if we anticipate that liquefaction can occur and cyclic mobility can occur, we can sustain uh, some very large horizontal deformations. Um, we call these deformations lateral spreading or lateral spread displacement. And this phenomenon is very common and very expensive. It's most common around rivers, ports, canals, um, places with high groundwater, and slopes. That, these are the places that we most commonly see lateral spread occurring. So, like I promised, this is a, sh a very brief lecture. So, what we're going to talk about in the upcoming lectures is how can we predict the amount of settlement that will occur following liquefaction triggering? How can we predict the amount of displacement that might occur if lateral spread happens? Uh, so, that's going to be the topic of our next lecture next week, but uh, appreciate your attention and I'll look forward to seeing you guys next week. Take care.